Whatever the rights and wrongs of the government's handling of a pandemic, there's no denying or avoiding that millions of people here in Great Britain and around the world have seen their lives turned upside down and inside out. Every day, I receive letters from people struggling to cope. Ruined relationships, loss of livelihoods, problems with physical and mental health, fear for children's well-being and children's futures. They talk about isolation and loneliness. All around us are people of all ages suffering from all manner of cares, depression and anxiety to the fore among those. Not to mention ill health caused directly or indirectly by the government's measures in the last two years. The sheer scale of the upset and the disillusionment, the fear, the anger, and perhaps worst of all, the loss of hope and of trust is overwhelming. All of it might reasonably make a person wonder what's to be done next. How we should as a society, as a civilization, make sense of what has happened. Now, the Reverend William Philip, he's been on the show before more than once. He's a minister of the Tron Church in Glasgow, as well as a faith leader. He's also a man of science, a medical doctor, specialising in cardiology. And he joins me now. Hello there, William. Good evening, Neil. Good to see you. Very nice to see you too, and thank you for making time for me. While the situation in which we find ourselves was sparked by COVID, I don't necessarily want to dwell on, on COVID, and, or not exclusively, and on, on the rights and wrongs of, of what the government did and didn't do. Rather, and I think perhaps more helpful, I want to talk about what truths about our society might have been exposed by the last two years. First of all, as a church leader, have you seen an increase in people coming to you for help in, in order to cope with their lives? I think definitely um, many uh, thinking people um, are trying to make sense of what's been going on. And a very common theme is people recognizing uh, a lot of uh, what they call darkness, wickedness, uh, evil uh, in the world and seeing an explanation for that. And I think it is the Christian worldview, as I've said many times, that, that does explain our world. It, it chimes with reality. Um, we're in the church at the moment, we're studying the book of Ecclesiastes, and there is a book which does not hide at all from reality. It says, life is full of vanity. Uh, it's a well-known phrase. It's, it's hard to translate. Um, it can mean ephemeral and fleeting, or it can, can also have a shade of meaning enigmatic and elusive. And really what he's saying is life is ephemeral, and we've got to learn to live with mortality that we can't control. And life is also enigmatic. We've got to learn to live with mystery that we can't comprehend. And unless we're willing to face up to that, we're striving uh, after wind, as he calls it. And the message is that uh, unless you realize that under the sun alone, we'll never grasp that, um, we're going to get nowhere. The point of the book is God has set eternity into the human heart, and we're never going to understand the world uh, unless we find wisdom from the transcendent, from that which is above the sun. And that's uh, what people are seeking for. They don't know where to find it, but the answer is uh, in the words of the one shepherd, in the word of God. The, the motto of my uh, university, uh, University of Aberdeen, was the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we all used to understand that, that, that the study of all of life, that's why university had that motto, the study of all of life is rooted in that transcendent uh, reality. And uh, what we need to understand is that only if we humble ourselves and embrace that reality by listening to the word of God, are we going to find the reality of life and be able to navigate through a mysterious and a mortal life, which will be full of mystery uh, and which has to take, uh, take account of, uh, of the reality of our mortality. But when we do, uh, there is a great hope for an eternal future, and that is the Christian hope. And that's what people are, I think, seeking after. Um, and. Uh, uh, and having their eyes open to a need um, which is coming to the surface and um, that it's the message of the Christian church to meet that need. You say people are looking for hope and I, and I think that is absolutely, I think you've, you've put your, your hand right on something very central, I think, to the, uh, to the, to the anxiety and, and the unhappiness that, that people are confronting at the moment. And obviously when people are looking for hope, they look for 
leadership, I suppose. Many people look to others to, to lead the way. Um, and when I ask this question, I, I don't only mean in the context of faith leaders, but uh, what have you thought of the leadership that has been offered by agencies across the board, the, you know, the, the church included, but, but, but more widely? What, have, have leaders stepped up to the plate? And if so, which ones would you point at as being good examples? I mean, I think I can really only rightly speak for the Christian church, um, but I'd have to say that I don't think we have adequately fulfilled our prophetic rule to the nation. Um, I feel rather ashamed about that, um, because how will that wisdom from heaven be heard on earth unless it's proclaimed by the church and by leaders of the church? I, I think probably the reason for that is that it's hard, isn't it, to speak truth to power. It's hard to speak against the majority. Uh, leaders of all kinds, including church leaders, like to think that they've got influence. And so um, they can easily persuade themselves to just speak what rulers want to hear, maybe what the public want to hear. And it's always been so. Um, if you look into the Bible, um, and Elijah the prophet, for example, the man of God, he was, he was called by King Ahab of Israel, you troubler of Israel, uh, because he told them things he didn't want to hear. Um, there's a great story we were looking at just the other day at the end of uh, First Kings, First Kings chapter 22, where that King Ahab wants an alliance with uh, the king of Judah uh, and to go fighting against the Syrians. And so the king of Judah says, well, uh, we better inquire uh, first from the Lord. And so Ahab gets all his prophets together, and there's 400 of them. And unanimously, of course, they back the king and they say, go for it, victory's sure. Um, so there you have the expert uh, theological science con uh, consensus, if you like. <laughs> but the king of Judah is not very convinced. And he says, well, isn't there another prophet, one actually of the Lord that we can see? And um, it's obvious that these are, just, these are just government shills. And of course, then Ahab says, well, there is one chap, but I hate him because every time he prophesies for me, he prophesies bad things. But they go and get him anyway. And, and uh, he just responds sarcastically and says, oh, yes, of course, king. Yes, you're, go you're going to be victorious. Go and, go and do that. And uh, the result of that is the king throws a fit and throws him into prison and says, keep him there till I come back. Um, but in fact, um, he was telling the truth. He was telling the king what he didn't want to hear. And nothing changes. In the New Testament, the apostle Paul says to Timothy, his protege, that in the time after Christ and the apostles, people will turn aside from truth to myths. And so they'll accumulate all sorts of teachers who tell them exactly what their itching ears want to hear. But his message is, you as a man of God must be sober and endure suffering and speak the truth in season or out, whether people want to hear it or not. But you'll be hated for it. You'll suffer for it. I think and, there's definitely um, a sense, <laughs> William. I think there's, I think there's definitely a sense, William, in, in, this, in this modern era, in this time in which we find ourselves, that truth is... Uh, has become a, a has become debatable, uh, and and in its place to some extent is just is just opinion, and and some opinions are more equal than others. Um, but have we have we do you think as a as a society in the West do you think we've lost sight of happiness, what happiness actually is, and and where happiness is to be found? You know we, we've we've long been taught to accept that we live in a consumerist society, that we're, you know, we've got our three score and 10 and that's all, then, you know, then it's over. Uh, do you think in the midst of that, we've, we've, we've lost track of, of how to be happy? I think that's true. Um, I think our culture is marked increasingly, isn't it, by fear. Um, I came across a very interesting uh, essay by Paul Kings North, uh, which published recently. And, and he said this, which I think is very important. He said, there's a throne at the heart of every culture. And whoever sits on that throne will be the force that we take our instruction from. And he says that the modern experiment has been the act of dethroning uh, both literal and human sovereigns and the representative of the sacred order and replacing them with just purely human abstract notions. Um, and as a result, we've become slaves to the self and slaves to the power of money. Uh, he says, monstrous worshippers before the monstrous idol uh, of progress. Now, that I think is a, is a powerful insight into our society. And, and, and I would say um, that that dethroning of the transcendent, the dethroning of, uh, of, of, 
of uh, the morality that comes from the Christian faith uh, is what is what lies behind that. And when you cut out tr absolute truth, when you cut out um, the trust in that which is transcendent, you, you are left in a fog of confusion. And that doesn't lead to joy and happiness. Um, it, it, it leads to fear. Frank Furedi uh, has written a lot about fear, and he speaks about the fear of God having been replaced by the fear of life and how science hasn't liberated us from craven fear. People like uh, Bertrand Russell and so on said that that's, that's what would happen, but actually the opposite has happened. And uh, we've not been liberated, we've, we've been filled with a dread uh, of the future, and that has dejoyed uh, people's lives. Uh, and so when you, when you throw out truth, ultimate truth, because you throw out the ultimate rule of God, it doesn't lead to liberation as people think it will, it leads actually to bondage. And I think that lies behind a very great deal of uh, the confusion in our, in our society today. That is, once again, I find listening to you so fascinating and so inspiring because the, the line that you have to take uh, is one that's, that's not so often, I think, aired it's so readily. So th thank you so much for making time for us and you know, in inviting us to think in that, in that uh, older way and thinking about ancient wisdom. Thanks very much for being with me tonight, William, and I hope to see you soon. Now, I, 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 I find listening to, to the Reverend William there, I find it very reassuring and calming. But what did you think about what you had to say, John, about that, that, that science uh, uh, you know, has not has not necessarily in over the last couple of years led us to happiness. There's and been so not, much unhappiness. It's not led to answers, has it? And consumerism hasn't either. And you'd have thought something like this pandemic would have brought us together. You know, it would have been a massive team effort. But I think, as illustrated by our little discussion earlier, it hasn't. It's pulled us apart even more because it, it came straight after Brexit. Uh, ironically, I find myself not on the same side as many of the people I was when it, Brexit was happening. But Brexit was important, but it was nowhere near as important as dealing with the pandemic. And what I think's happened is those kind, that, those kind of tactics have, on both sides have carried on during the pandemic. And I think it's been wholly bad for society. Society needs to come back together, which is why I was trying to say earlier, those health workers today and that demonstration is so ridiculous. And the answer to the question isn't yes or no. The answer is, I wouldn't want to be treated by somebody who hadn't been vaccinated. And I won't have to soon because I agree with what the government are doing. I think Professor Witty was right all those months ago when he said, well, people aren't already vaccinated. And that's my point. And together we should have gone over this, but we haven't. It's ironic there's that campaign group led by the Alan or whatever his name is. Miller. Uh, yeah, him, the publican guy. The hero. Uh, well, in your opinion, not in my opinion. But he. it's ironic that that's called Together we do need to come together now. And I think the Reverend's right. And there's bigger things. Abby, how do we get... Ultimately, we need to be together. We, we do. We share one island. Mm. Uh, and mm. we need to, to find ways to cleave together. We do. Now, you, you, the three of us here tonight are a, are a, are a, are a living in real-time demonstration of mm. how hot temperatures are running. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, just, we're just exemplars. What do you think will have to happen to achieve the the coming back together that we absolutely need, even if concessions have to be made. I mean, I, I loved um, Reverend Williams. I thought it was absolutely marvellous, especially, especially the last bit where you talked about when you when you cast God away, you actually end up with 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 it, you know be, people being enslaved by other things. And actually, I'm wearing Bob Moran's lovely Bob Moran's T-shirt, which is exactly that: the the medic, you know, with the mask, the vaccines, and it says enough. And the enslaved kind of Caliban creature. Who, who's become a creature without this, um, w without liberation, um, because we're, we're, we're because we've we've pursued ideology um, and, and not truth and beauty. I would say one thing. I, 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 I would say that in months, years to come, truth and re reconciliation is going to happen, where we sit down. I mean, one day I would like to say I, I can't speak for everyone, John, but one day I, I, I hope that I'll be able to forgive you for your. For, for your views, and I, genu I genuinely Forgive mean that. Me. John, what do you feel, though, when listening to, to the Reverend there, I, I, I'm struck by how unfamiliar often it is to hear people talk about their belief in God. Yeah. You just don't hear it so much. What do you, how does it make you feel when you, when you hear a man like the Reverend William, and, and indeed Abby, well, talking in that way that is unfamiliar? Yeah, it was not unfamiliar to me. I was brought up as a Christian, and I was a very close friend of the ex-bishop of uh, Bedford, who actually 
was a big influence in my life. I can respect people who've got religious But, but it's a voice that has gone quiet. Well, it has, and it's in all religions. I've got you know, relatives within my family who are Hindus, and when they start talking about their religion, it's bizarre because you don't hear it in normal par par parlance. But I tell you what we all need. We all need to be a bit more stoic. We all need to be uh, able to cope with our problems on our own and then collectively. What's happened is we've passed all that over to the state, um, and that is why, you know, we have these rows now about was Witchy right, is Valance right? None of us take that kind of responsibility. And taking responsibility isn't not having the vaccination. And this idea of, oh, bodily autonomy, how precious, how privileged these people are. Listen, we were faced with something. We weren't quite sure what it was. And let's not get carried about this, about this, uh, away with this latest variant, which clearly isn't as dangerous. And, you know, thank God it isn't. Thank God we are coming out. We, we all share that, that we want to get back to a normal life. But what we've got to do is uh, this, this division has to stop. And this idea that Abby's going to forgive me, I'm going to get absolution from Abby, is just really, frankly, ludicrous, isn't it? Entrenched, entrenched positions, consensus feeling like it's a long way off. I, I mm. think we can all see and hear, uh, you know, how far away the... The, the, the reconciliation that, that Abby mentioned might be, how, how distant that might yet be, and we've got a long road to walk.